so yeah we've come to the end of the uh, presentation by comrade shongo so i believe that we were able to follow and uh, learn a few things from uh, his presentation and we we'll move to the parts of discussion and so we encourage um, uh, listeners to um, raise their hands electronically if they have a question or contribution to give so uh, we're looking out for that in the chat box so um, okay, so yeah uh, so the OAG, 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 you have your hand up, you can unmute and go ahead. Thank you very much for the presentation and the inputs that um, others have put in there. Uh, I don't know if I'm audible. Uh, sign. I'm audible. Am I audible? Yes. Oh, okay. Thank you. So um, in terms of the social relations, I'm just going to add a little bit. To it. In terms of the social relations and the conditions of evol evolution of societies, uh, we must also state that um, if societies are left alone and are going to strive for the better or the best way in terms of social relations and their own development, then we must also understand the function of imperialism and how it knocks or truncates that upward evolutionary pathway in which all these nations you know were on because if a bunch of people come with gunboats and weapons to distort developmental processes in societies and knock the society out of focus you know with domination cultural domination physical domination stagnation of all aspects of society and in in, in um, the case where they took millions of people away from Africa and other parts, you know, we have to see that the effect of this, you know, is that it eviscerates or removes the potential for development, potential for upward evolution of that society. And studying the social relations of that, that um, uh, truncating process or that violent process that has knocked these countries off, you know, or studying imperialism for short, is to know that we need to reassess and rediscover a social um, relation that facilitates rapid upward development for Africa and you know, countries that are suffering under the domination of imperialism. So it is very important to bring home or Africa or Nigeria or other countries still that the form of imperialism is developing or mal developing. Sorry, I'd like to use the word mal developing because of the dictates of imperialism. And of course, those create contradictions where most countries become mono mono producers of crops or mono producers of resources and all that. You know, so we have to understand that what imperialism does or what this underdevelopment, as Ronnie Ronnie puts it. You know, he used it as a verb, you know, as Rodney puts it, is that it leaves a lingering or a, um, a lingering uh, harm or lingering destruction in the evolutionary pathway of countries that, are, that this terror has been visited upon. And for Africa and all, all Latin America, we can see Asia, we can still see the signs, the unmistakable signs of this underdevelopment in their societies, be it economically, in terms of their social relations that has created new social relations that is harmful to the development of these people that the terror has been visited upon. You know, so we have to understand what it's what it what it did and what it is still doing to us as a people. You know, so that's my own submission on that matter. Yeah, I want to say something in addition to what um, OEG has said. Can I come in, please? One second, please. I, I just want to quickly just come in there. Um, raise your hand and then you'll be called. Um, so, uh, yeah, the thing is, thank you, OEG, for that. And, and bear in mind that we have only discussed what is development today and be discussing next week what is under development in a sense. But it, 
We cannot speak of development without speaking of underdevelopment, just as we cannot speak of underdevelopment without speaking of development. And as we, we said at the end of that, as we can see very clearly that development, especially um, the European capitalist development, has existed on the basis of the exploitation of others in terms of the classes in its own society. Um, we can also raise issues about patriarchy and the role of women in that uh, as it, its development unfolded. That's also an important aspect of that. And also the underdevelopment. What people don't understand, and I think this is one important thing this book teaches, is that development, as you have seen it, capitalist development, presupposes the underdevelopment of other of others um, of other um, societies you know um, and we will be looking into that in more detail next week um Adibaya, please come in uh you already stated what i wanted to say but i just want to just add one or two things what i actually want to say is that we need like uh, i want to correct um this popular notions people usually say especially from the west they usually says that um, after 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 um, your colonization, when um, the colonialists left Africa, why why haven't get built our continent to the standard whereby we could be able to compete with the metropolis country? So one thing I just want to understand, like people to understand, like OEJ just said, we need to understand the hands of the imperialists in Africa, because Afri Africa went through. Um, Arab slavery that cost us almost 700 years. Out of that 700 years, we are taking the Hebrew people in the, um, um, in the society who are the crime man, um, the, medicine, the medicine man, um, what's it called? Let's say all professionals in that particular era. So if we are shipping people off a particular continent for close to 700 years, do you expect the, 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 let me say, do you expect the society or the environment to develop? It can't. And even when the what's called um, the Westerners came to to Africa, um, to Africa, they even continued the same system. They even institutionalized the same system the Arab did. So they, they too, they continued taking and taking and taking and taking people off. And through that aspect, there was no form of development. There was no form of social development during that era of slavery. And people should also, also, also have to understand that when colonization even came. It even it, it, that, was, it, that was one of the worst testing because why it only created one straightforward pathology whereby what we needed from you guys is not to develop yourself just start producing cash crop that's all we needed from you guys and that was the only economic quality for you to be able to survive so if you who was a who, who was was it called who was it, uh, a fisherman or was was a craftsman doesn't have a market to sell whatever you are producing. You don't have another choice that to fall into the path into the path that the European markets needed to leave your 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 talents, which are which be able to, to to develop your capacity into um, the path that could, that you use to survive. You know, do the normal cash crop and able to get cash. That's that's the only other thing. And you could then your new colonialist system even itself. The only thing that it demands from us is the production of people who are able to satisfy or let me say who are able to complement the, the metropolis economy. So Africa have not even reached that stage whereby we're able to develop ourselves to the full extent whereby individual capacity could be able to, to come together and form a new social relation for the development of Africa. So what what I is this saying saying in his book still happening presently right now you haven't able to discover our social relation that will bring the development of what 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 we should be as a continent as a people as a race so in my own submission people when people are trying to make the analogy or trying to buttress about development they should try to understand the 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 the, the aspect of imperialism which has able to crush the development of our people so if we really develop in the aspect of, of, of economy, we should be able to understand that we still keep with our social relation. And that social relation is where the old development entails. So let's celebrate ourselves. If we're able to celebrate ourselves and find a new social relation for ourselves, then the aspect of economic 
development will rise up straight up and that's what china got china was able to use that cultural revolution to be able to create that economic development that they needed so that's my solution for now hello okay thank you um i'm going to take uh comrade idris uh, please go ahead unmute yourself hello everyone uh, i hope you can hear me yes we can awesome uh so yes thank you for the uh, wonderful um presentation despite the initial hiccups um i just have two points uh to make the first one i think is in response to um comrade adebayo's um um remark um i mean while i appreciate the um depth of thought that has gone into it i think it's also very important to um be very clear about the distinctions between um uh, arab slavery and uh european uh raids uh i think these two things are not comparable on um any kind of scale um because the in fact if you think about it the reason the cross saharan uh trade routes quickly died out was because of the arrival of um these slave ships so it just tells you that it was the 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 cross saharan uh um trade routes which also transported slaves to the middle east um was not able to um uh, sustain in the face of the barrage of um the european um, um trade assaults um so yet yeah, that's just that on that point uh the second one um which i uh, point i want to make is um based on uh, the the chinese model and I I I'm only making this point because you you already made the example of China and in fact it's not really a point it's more of a you know general seeking general thoughts on this so China has made great strides um you know that has lifted 800 million people out of poverty and um it's in, in a way that is incomparable to any nation in the world <laughs> um i was however discussing with my a chinese colleague of mine recently and he said to me that many chinese people are apprehensive um about certain aspects of their social organization um the one one of which is healthcare he he made example of that specifically and i guess um the the reason that came up as an example for him is because he is here in uk now studying and he has um experienced the national health service and how um much more um encompassing it is than say the chinese um uh, system so he was saying to me that um this is what one way that china has not been able to develop and i i i stopped him in his track because i i felt like he wasn't taking into consideration um um the historical context as well like for example the uk's national health service was um largely funded by um you know the, the income that uk made from uh imperialism uh, colonialism not even imperialism but colonialism itself um some uh, something china has not you know done at um you know in any significant way anywhere at any point in its history so um uh so so th that question got me wondering even in a country like china where you you know the communist party is popular and you know people still appreciate what's happening just a little bit of um exposure to things that happen in the west without any sort of historical context can very quickly erode the sort of trust that people have in a system that is really trying hard to develop itself despite the onslaught from um imperialist nations so it's it's just a wonder or a fear of mine like you know how do you how do you you know stand against this kind of exposure 
um, when you're talking of populations of hundreds of millions of people, which you very well know that not all of them would be interested in his, history. So yeah, that's just my thought. I, I wonder if anyone has any thoughts on that. It's, it's, it's just something that was that bothered me, um, you know, from this, my discussions with my colleague. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, if anybody wants to contribute to that, please um, feel free to go ahead and uh, do raise your hand. Um, I think, you know, the question of China is something that has to be, you know, studied carefully. I, in fact, personally, I was wondering about this recently and uh, I, um, the thing about the health, health system, you know, aspects of, of, of that, you know, and, uh, and I think you make a, a quite correct point that, you know, that's what, what people don't understand about how the, you know, the wealth of the West was developed to be able to afford, you know, um, certain social welfare programs that they put on. And certainly the solution, and, you know, people look at China and see, it, oh, wow, that makes capitalism. If you just plan it and develop it a certain particular way to be all right. I really only see this as a holding stage, which cannot continue. If it, it's going to be in constant um, conflict with the West, uh, it's going to be expensive, which is you know the situation the Soviet Union had to face. And eventually, while it remains isolated, um, I don't actually see it surviving for long, you know. And that and that is the that is the issue. It's like in a kind of holding stage. The wealth remains unequally distributed at the world stage, very unequally distributed. Um, and having to maintain a capitalist system in order to survive in, in capitalism is itself something we have to ask a question about. For how long, you know, um, will that, should that be the model that we see for Africa? Um, it's something we should be open to discussion. I think OAG wants to come in on that. <coughs> so go ahead, please. Thank you. Um, in my own intake or my own input to the China issue, like rightly, both of the, um, the speakers have said, is that most people do not see where they are coming from or do not take in cognizance the depths from which their country, you know, is rising out from under, of like, you know. So it makes them kind of maybe, you know, once you're in the UK and you want what they have in the uk then what were the processes that led to that glittering streets or that you know magnificent structure that they have you know in, in in their own country you know which is from the stagnation of other people if capital has been concentrated in their own country to give you know concessions more concessions to the working class or the reproduction of the working class you know then it means the immigration of other people. So uh, I'm seeing, yeah, and then we don't know the trajectory which China might go, you know, like um, Comrade Chongo has said, but I'm thinking this is a holding phase whereby they now have to seriously look for a way forward in terms of, you know, um, passing that, uh, the, 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 spe it has the spectacular or the interesting arrangements that they have on ground that has lived like we can't whatever it is we can't deny the fact that this country raised 800 million people out of poverty like this is still amazing how many people, people in in all these fables are by biblical tales jesus fed five thousand people so in that case then it means china is you know this what like so if you're able to raise it eight hundred thousand people, then it means capital has another function in that society, which is in co which that state recognizes. And we're hoping that they don't get carried away, you know, um, on the capitalist trade and then forget the historical duty that you know they have to render to the people, and then of course build a society that is more inclusive that kind of phases out the extreme wealth inequality. You know, albeit um, nice, like regions are coming out and saying, oh, they are totally wiped out poverty in this region. Totally, like, this is material gains for the people. So they, the person that has left China and 
that, that the UK must be aware of this um, historical um, pathway or the things that the country has to go through in order, you know, to to get to where they are, you know. So I just think it's very important. It's an important point to be made to that person so that they will know that development is so, is a work in progress. It's not something, oh, today I'm not developed, then tomorrow I'm developed, you know. So that's just the point that I want to pass across. Even if in Nigeria we get it in order or in Africa we get it in order, we, we won't be developed overnight. There will be some things that we have been exposed to or that someone in the West has been exposed to in terms of development or how the road should be or how the houses should be, you know, that we might not be able to do at that point in time. But we'll look for ways around it to at least increase, you know, the life expectancy of our people, you know, give them accessible health care and all that, and then build it into a more sophisticated more housing system or economic system as time goes on, you know. So how Afri if Africa starts to get it right with good leadership, it will also be interesting to see if we'll have a holding phase or we'll just jump directly to this thing, depending on what the um, global economic system, role of imperialism, you know, is going to play in our upward evolution, hopefully. Thank you. All right. Um, thank you for that um, intervention, um, Comrade uh, AG. Uh, comrade, uh, comrade Idris, um, you have your hands raised. You have the floor, so go ahead. <coughs> thank you, Comrade OG. Uh Yes, yes. Uh, I, I entirely agree with what you said, especially with regards to that particular person who is here in UK and was complaining. Um, actually, in, uh, I just gave it a little bit more thought, and I, I, I think China has handled the question I asked fantastically well, because when you think about it, it uh, the, the um, party, anyway, is in absolute, almost absolute control of information flow in China. Um, so even though, you know, a few mil, um, millions of Chinese are outside of China studying, they are the minority. I think most Chinese are actually in, inside of China and most of their access to information comes from the party. Um, in a way, and you, you know, a party approved um, information dispensing system, anyway. Uh, and um, in, in some, in a lot of ways, it makes sense because you know, um, it it protects them from the onslaught and barrage of um, Western media propaganda, uh, which which we know can do a lot of damage to people who don't take context into consideration. And in fact, we've seen an example of, you know, what that, that has been able to achieve um, with respect to the um, attack of, on, on the Capitol a few days ago in the United States. And we also see how, you know, not just how social media can actually be used to manipulate people, um, to, towards dangerous um, ideologies, but also how the owners of the social media itself can then use this as a power grabbing um, or power appropriating um, opportunity, as we've seen Twitter, Facebook, and the rest do. So it seems like moving forward in the West, these social media platforms are going to be um, are going to wield even more power, far more power than they have in the past. So yeah, the, maybe the answer is in control, <laughs> is in controlling um, the flow of information, which a lot of people would find uh, perhaps shocking. But anyway, it, it's what it is, isn't it? But, uh, that's my thought. All right, thank you, um, Comrade Idris. So, um, we would like to throw to the floor again that if anyone have a question, contribution, you can please um, raise your hand electronically and uh, we'll take your question or your contribution. So, um, anyone? okay, uh, we have um, Bumi's hand raised. Uh, Bumi, you have the floor, please.
Okay. Hi, everyone. Uh, so I think that we've like been focusing on like bigger like macro level stuff, and that's fine. But like towards the end of that, towards the end of like that, um, what the development he talks about how like bourgeois like economics will like ignore like social relations and class relations and all that stuff and be like no like it's just land labor like all those like stuff which is part of like development but like i think that because of like how society likes to like mirror itself in certain aspects and like replicate like how like power dynamics on the bigger level like will show up on the smaller level i think that it's also important to like in our like interpersonal relationships like at the lower level, like in families, especially in like the African setting, whereby like the family is like the major, like it's like the biggest organization in which like, like it's essentially like, I feel like I see the family as like the center of like everything. And then things start like sprouting up from the family, if that makes any sense. So I feel like, especially at like the family level, interrogating like, interrogating like colonial ideas of what like development is is like a, like a good way to like get people like moving in a way because I'm like all these words these are like really big words not that they're big words I think but these are like you know like big ideas and big words like how do you like that's what I always think about like how do we like make this kind of like language accessible to people and like how do we um how do we make sure like the people that we're trying to to reach um come to grips with like the actual reality of their like material like consequences like and not just like the mysticism like on account of like imperialism and stuff like how do we get people to like fully understand what like you know he even talks about cultural like imperialism so like even if something like mtv is on you know and even even something as like someone might say trivial as Big Brother is like, you know, imported from the West. And so even something as like trivial, even though I don't think it's trivial, you might say trivial as Big Brother, people would be like, you know, this can be better than that. And like things like those comparisons come, start coming. And those like impositions of Western ideals of like Western, like how we should organize ourselves start coming. So like, how do we, even like the nuclear family like it's an invention of like white supremacy so like how do we like start moving away from because like even like back in the day like people would like have big families because they needed to you know go on the farm like the way like our politics was organized was like would took into account like the family structure so like i think on the like on the like minuscule, on the smaller level, on the micro level, I should say, there's like a lot of like work to be done towards moving people. Well, I'll say moving people to the left, but moving people to recognize like the material, like the material, like consequences, like what's causing me to to be like this. Like, how can we start like organizing our family dynamics to better suit? Um, our situation to better help our situation. How can we start organizing uh, relations between um, gendered people to start like um, developing or you know coming out from that stage? How can we reject um, Western like impositions and ideals of um, gender and sexuality and you know things of that nature in the relationship between you know class and things like that? How can we start? Um, rejecting those ideals that will help our um development so i just i just wanted to to bring offer like micro perspective Thanks. okay um thank you for that i i, I think that's a quite interesting you know and uh um and something to bear in mind uh i um I, and, and the aspect of cultural imperialism that you mentioned cannot be understated and the way in which a kind of um in this process of capitalist development and imperialism you know certain things be begin to be taken for granted which conflict with 
traditional ways, you know, of uh, in, in which families have been um, relating over time. And there's certainly a lot of that going on. And in terms of how we oppose it, we certainly have to consider this. Um, but I don't, you know, I certainly don't have the answer to that. It's open to the to people to contribute to and uh, we'll come back to that. I think, yeah, you know, it's, it's very important. I just want to thank um, Wale. Um, you're welcome. Please, um, you have the floor. Thank you. Um... I uh, just want to take a moment to, to um, share with you, uh, uh, my children really, um, uh, how exciting it is to listen to your generation uh, interrogate and contemplate and dialogue about some of these issues. I am a contemporary of Walter Rodney. I'm from Guyana. I knew Walter and his family. Um, children, wife, we worked together for many years. I'm retired now. Um, as a matter of fact, I left for a moment to go into my study to find the, the old, my copy of the old book since you were, uh, you reminded me of, of how little I remember from how Europe underdeveloped Africa. Uh, uh, but, um, so yes, I'm, I'm really trying to say to you that it, it, it gives me optimism to listen to another generation of, of um, thinkers and, and activists grappling with these questions, especially since many of you appear to me to be uh, connected to the continent. I do want to make a couple of other observations though, please consider these to be advice um, from my generation to yours. I'm an older man, an elder. Um, as we think about um, China and uh, admire its uh, uh, undebatable achievements, I really want to caution you to be um, vigilant about its covert and encroaching imperialism. Uh, especially in African spaces like the Caribbean and the continent of Africa. Um, because we, we understand well enough European colonialism, we have survived to some extent th that Holocaust, but there's another one coming and it's, it's, it's already in our lives and coming with a certain uh, mystification. Um, uh, so I would caution you to, to, to watch what is going on in, in Africa and in the Caribbean uh, that is driven by the, 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 the unrestrained um, uh, Chinese ambition for resources. Um, the other thing is, I, 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 uh, um, the comment about um, uh, models of sexual development, intersexual relations, gender relations, and so on, uh, and culture generally. I think we, you particularly, you since you are from the continent and are close to our traditions, I think we ought to prioritize our own traditions. Um, the, the practices and judgments of our ancestors. That is not to say that they are not um, uh, inhibited by mysticism, um, that they are perfect. I'm not suggesting that at all. But I am suggesting that they offer us a, 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 I don't want to say a field, a body of, 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 of practices, time-tested practices, from which we can distill new models of human development and relationships that really inhere in our own emergence rather than the emulation of other peoples. What is going on in Europe and in America may work for them, I, I am not sure, but um, uh, it doesn't have to be models that we 
um, emulate or adopt, even with adaptation, we need to think of adopting and adapting our own traditions. Our future must be driven by the Sankofa principle. We go back to get what we need to go forward. Um, I'm so glad that I was, someone called, sent me a text from South Africa and told me about this. So I got up very early. I had to get up at six o'clock. I'm in Atlanta uh, at the moment, but I'm so delighted that I was able to join you. I hope I can do it again. And I, um, if someone would tell me how I can get the slides, um, I'll go back to my own book, Walter Rodney's book, and Manning Marables. Um, derivative how capitalism on the developed African America and look look at them again just because I came to your session today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. And um it's a pleasure to have you here and thanks for the comments. Um first of all let me say that the slides will be available um on our YouTube page. Um I think we have posted some of the details of our social media, the slides and the recording of, of that, the presentation, and parts of the discussion that we have been able to record will be available. You can also find previous work we have done on uh, Franz Fanon's Legend of the Earth. Um, and, you know, we are just starting with how Europe and that developed Africa. We are going to be continuing with Franz Fanon's Wretched of the Earth. We are also soon going to be covering class struggle in Africa. And, um, and after that, we certainly hope our next book will be on the topic of gender, but we haven't yet determined how that will go. But uh, yeah, and in terms of your comments, uh, I uh, certainly appreciate that. I think for us, it's a question of, <clears throat> of maintaining independence um, through all this through imperialism, independence of mind, I think is key. But the thing is that we are quite aware of is that, you know, in any context of discussion, of analyzing and appreciating what is going on in the world, that we have to sieve out a lot of propaganda and indoctrination. And we, we certainly do not underestimate the Western propaganda at all. And, uh, and we certainly are aware that, you know, in my own personal view, I put it as a personal view that as Rodney has defined capitalism and its development, then China itself cannot succeed unless it operates within that framework in which a group of people provide resources, raw materials, at very cheap rates. That is how capitalism works. It must get the input cheaply, principally labor, but also the, the materials. And so we cannot say, um, you know, that China is uh, just to look at China innocently in that game, but we, we must also be factual and look and look at the real dynamics still governing Africa in terms of imperialism, which remains, you know, the, the Western framework. You know, just to give an example, recent people have been talking about Chinese loans and so on. And I think we really have to save out a lot of propaganda. But when we look at it, in, in the case in which Nigeria was being spoken about, um, there was something about, if you take this loan, you are going to lose your sovereignty. It was actually quite a lot of propaganda, not understanding what the whole general system of loans is um, in terms of sovereign, the use of the word sovereign and whatever. But in all that discussion, people don't even know that we, we received a loan from the IMF and the World Bank recently that insisted that we must increase the price of, of petrol, we must, you know, increase the price of electricity. That was the, those were the conditions. We have had conditions to defund education. We have had a conditions to do so much damage. And yet this, these things are treated as if, you know, they are nothing. It, it's, 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 um, it's a reality, it's, it's, it's a difficulty to be factual in all this debate. 
and I, I think uh, and at the end of the day, African unity and African independence becomes crucial through all of this. Um, is all I, I, would, I would say, really. Um, in terms of the book itself, as, as you know, and I think it's the thing that I think we should open for people to say um, about, because Rodney was, was writing this in the 1950s. You know, socialism was, socialist economies were growing faster than capitalist ones. We had the Soviet Union. We had some possibilities. Even the China he was discussing is not the China of today. You know, it was still a fully, you know, let us say socialist China. We, uh, and, uh, and we have to ask the questions that, okay, given the history and what has gone and what we have before us today, how do we see how our own future development should be? Which is a question I actually asked earlier, and I'll throw that open again, you know. Um, I have my own opinions on that, but, I, you know, it's open for people to come in, you know, and on the general comments that the, the elder has made. Um, I think, sir, you, uh, you still have your hand up. Do you want to come in again? Yeah, please go ahead. Yes, I just wanted to make an announcement. Uh, every Saturday, I have a Zoom conference with some old friends and colleagues. We've been friends and for 40 years. One of them participates from Hargisa in Somaliland. And since you mentioned your work on Fanon, I thought I would mention to you that Hussein Abdullahi Bulhan is uh, now the founder and president of Franz Fanon University in Somaliland. And he is one of my dear friends. In fact, when I get out of this meeting, we'll be starting ours in a little while, within an hour. And I'm going to tell them about, about um, uh, this exposure that I've had. But I want to tell you about Hussein's work in the Horn of Africa, because you may know, you may not know that he started this institution. And um, some of you may... Uh, want to see what they're doing and you might even be able to participate in some of their programs because it's all going online. Uh, it's extremely affordable and he aspires to offer academic exposure to people across the, the globe, particularly in the Caribbean and uh, other places um, through a, this Fanonian concretization of post-secondary education. <laughs> Thanks. Well, well, yeah, thank you. We will certainly be very interested in that. And um, how, you know, we are aware of, is there any way, you know, we can get, you know, maybe more details about that? Yes. Yeah. Yes, I'll post, I'll post the uh, his information on the chat right now. Okay, that would be great. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, I would like to um, comment on what Comrade um, Omawale was saying about China. Um, colonizing Africa. I don't know if that's exactly how he phrased it, uh, you know, through loans and the involvement in trade in Africa. Uh, well, I'll say that I don't know why we're so scared of China and it's not as if Africa do not um, um, accept loans from other Western countries as well. Uh, I, I don't see why we don't read other the same meaning we read we read to uh, China's loans um, when talking about uh, Western loans. So I don't see why we're so uh, afraid of China. And um, you know, it's I would say that it's part of the Western propaganda. You know, flooding the internet, misinforming. Um, vast majority of our people and uh, we are not looking critically into why are we actually taking these loans as a, as a nation and uh, you know we have a, a vast majority of our leaders in Africa you know taking those loans and 
you know, for example, you know, let's look at the Congo. You know, we Congo has a uh, mass deposit of mineral resources, and uh, that tells us that the continent is, I mean, the country is is rich, but there's uh, poverty all over the place in Congo, in Nigeria as well. Uh, we have uh, we are one of the world leading um, export of um, crude oil and uh, there's still mass poverty in Africa. So it tells us that we have a puppet government who are uh, agents of Western uh, empire in Africa. We are not giving much attention and much uh, you know worry that we have uh, Western puppet littered all over Africa. Um, underdeveloping the country by taking these loans from Western countries and, you know, um, using the old colonial model to educate our people because I think Comrade Bumi was talking about um, exposing um, um, our kids to this uh, history and how do we break it down to them for understanding. And I think that is also crucial because I think China is not actually, of course, we have to be wary of China, but I don't think that um we should um, excuse the western government from the debate because this problem actually started from them so we have to you know compare notes and see the china's relationship and um uh, the western relationship and see which one is actually uh dangerous for africa because i i can say i know from my own in my opinion that china actually helped to um you know control or let's say reduce the hegemony of the western markets in africa because they came in with uh with competition it was a it was a, a competitive market you know like you can get this thing for for less you know like look at the iphone it's very expensive look at china they are producing mass um uh, uh model of mo um, iphone products you know for example though we are supposed to producing all of this as well because they get most of these uh uh materials for production here in africa but it still goes back to the fact that why do we have leaders who are not uh upgrading the 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 the, the um, human um development of our people here in africa so if we have to ask these questions we have to ask these questions we shouldn't um excuse from the day because it's not complete if we want to, you know, just focus on China and we don't talk about the root causes of why we are retrogressing as a nation and why we keep electing bad leaders uh, in Africa. So I just want to quickly check that in. Thank you. Um, yeah, so, yeah, I would, um, uh, I say Bumi had your hand raised. I, I just want to quickly add, that was, I think he can't speak in. I just want to add this is Shongo again. Um, now, actually, Inka made a very important point. I, I don't want to really dwell too much on the China thing, but you know, um, the the question of hegemony. I, and if we look through the the mind frame of the of the Western imperialists um, over time, uh, they have been very clear about maintaining. Um, uh, how do I put it? Uh, you know. A sole leader, um, sole ownership of the world. You know, Europe being backed by America's big guns, and the Soviet Union for a long time was a big problem. So when the Soviet Union collapsed, it was like that's why they had to come out and say it was the end of history. You know, and really they, they meant it. They, they saw now the full flow of, of of their control over the world unhindered completely, um, and. Uh, China now became a problem, and many people might not know that the attack on Iraq, um, the first attack came with the, with the fall of the Soviet Union. Um, it was really to send a message to the world that we control this world, and now the Soviet Union gone, this is ours. Really, that was it. The second attack, they actually wrote papers on it, something called the Project for a New American Century, that they're going to, they're attacking Iraq with an eye on China. It was again to demonstrate the, the power of the empire. And we must not underestimate this, that, that in the, without China, the hegemony runs uncontrolled. Regardless, we must maintain our independence and seek the best for ourselves and to seek to have a revolution in our countries. 
that is it. But the idea, you know, that we, we, we should understand this, that if this uh, scenario of the West being without control would be very bad for us. That we know about Africa. We know about the guns that they have planted next to us, uh, straight out of our heads. They don't do imperialism in a soft, soft way at all. It is very direct. It's either you do what we want or we get you out of the way. We, we kill your leaders. And, what, and so that was, we must always bear in mind what imperialism has done and continues to do. That's all I'll say, say on that for now, please. So let me just take Bumi. Um, please, you have your hand up. Thank you. You have the floor. Yeah, I just wanted to just add quickly into like what everyone was saying about xenophobia, like how like propaganda from the West, like xenophobia is, is very real. Um, like when people don't talk about the, the full story of like Western imperialism, it, it really like begins to, 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 and I'm not like, anti-blackness is global. We're not going to like get into like a whole thing of Afro-pessimism today, but like, Af like anti-blackness is global, it's everywhere. So it's not, it's not like the Chinese are like big fans of Africans or anything of that nature. But like when you're comparing like Western <laughs> imperialism to Chinese, like I think that for people who are comfortable, like for where I am, I'm like in the DC area, like it's, it would be easy for me to be like, oh yeah, it's China, bad, bad. But like if from the village where my parents are from, they're able to like make a little bridge or give more infrastructure that's going to improve the actual conditions of people today, as opposed to the US who is sending guns through Africa and like destabilizing like all these countries. I think that, yes, we can, because like nothing, no big change is going to come overnight. Like someone said, like, we're not going to chase away Europeans and chase away the Chinese and like everything be like jolly and like we have food and everything be great in like two days. Like that's so impossible. So like the little that we can get from China, from these, you know, I'm going to say they're predatory because I'm looking at the, the list of like from the debt management office in Nigeria, like where, you know, the list of our debts and China is like, they're all the way over there. The IMF is right on top and the World Bank is next and then International Development Association is next and the International Bank for Reconstruction and Development is next and the African Development Bank is next. Like there are all these people who are, you know, killing us, their, their fees are on our neck and China is way, you know, below over there. And if China can, you know, build a couple of buses or, you know, infrastructure, whatever it is that they're doing, that's going to improve their material lives people on the ground today, I don't think it's something that we should, you know, completely like reject or like, you know, bring, you know, Western like xenophobia until like into the mix. mix. And I think that um, a, a lot of like people, I don't know why like people believe that change is going to come, come from like the top or change is going to come from like these big, like bigger scale macro ideas, which is nothing wrong with having those ideas. But I really, I really honestly do believe that change really is going to come from our little interpersonal relationships like we like just the way we like taking that time and taking an effort to re-educate ourselves and re-educate the people in our community like people who we call community is so important because people still believe that like people like american propaganda is so big that someone from my family sent me a, a clip of reagan from like the 60s like with the whole Reagan Reaganomics whatever and like now we know how terrible Reagan was and you know hope he's riding in hell if there is a hell but like people still believe like he'll be like oh god bless America America is for everyone America is this people see like America as belonging to everyone so much so that when <laughs> when America is going through, through crisis like people in Nigeria would be like oh my god we're we're going through a crisis we're struggling. I'm like, we're not doing anything. They're going to crisis. This is good for us. Like, this has nothing to do with us. Like, this whole fiasco that happened two days ago, every, like, you see Nigerians, like, or Africans, like, panicking, like, oh my God, like, yes, we have to get Trump out. Like, no, no, like, this, <laughs> America is not us. We are not Americans. We are not Europeans. Like, we should be working about to bring about their destruction and destruction of the Western hegemon. Like, anything that chips away at their strength, that's where we need to be. Like, that's the corner where we need to be rejoicing. We are not Europeans. We are not American. No matter how included they make us feel, you know, no matter how many Nigerians Biden puts in his cabinets, no matter how many, you know, Nigerians are, you know, 
you know, the white supremacists love to do that thing. These are the superior Negroes. No matter how superior we feel ourselves to be in relation to other Black people in the diaspora, we are not Europeans. Like, we are not those people, and we need to be seeking to bring about their destruction in any way that we can. That is all I want to say. Um... Thanks, Bumi, for that. And yeah, I think again that the micro level you mentioned is is is, is very crucial, you know. And uh, really, you know, movements have to build that that um, you know relate to that. And I, I, you know, in, in the sense of of there's an ideology dominant that dominates, you know, that penetrates all the way down to the micro level, and you have to counter that, you know. And uh, in in your personal, you know, conversations, um, you know, and in going down to the grassroots, really, you know, um, and and I think the ideology and is is very, you know, I think with this whole China debate as well, I see this ideology of racism, white racism, framing the debate quite a lot, you know. Um, first of all, there's the you know. It's the is the ideology that you know talks about black people that has built up you know a subhuman uh, representation for black people, um, you know, and also it also frames it you know in terms of it frames the attitude to China. There's also this anti-Chinese xenophobia that is an American of american origin the way as far as i understand it and and then it it, it penetrates all the way we, we see the west the europeans as the ideal the dominant and we also actually do buy into this these concepts that they have about both the anti-black we buy it for ourselves the anti-black ideology but also buy the anti-chinese ideology it, it's um so we, we also do have this tendency of seeing the chinese as as low down in the pecking order, um, and uh, um, yeah, but I, I think you know the way I see it in terms of of, of talk, you know the issue about the micro level. The way I see it, I'm not, I don't know if you agree with that, but in terms of the importance of building movements from the ground up, people-based movements that you know are community-oriented, that that you know have a lot of you know interactions among people in the community that you know start to actually have an impact in the way people think uh, you know that's the way i would see how to tackle that question partially you know um so yeah uh, oig you have your hand up you can come in all right <clears throat> thank you um, I just want to add um, the case of China um, and what's been going on on our own continent. It's very essential to look at, first and foremost, the social relations and the dominating class order in our own society in Africa. If we understand that we have nothing but extreme profiteers as leaders, if we understand that these people are here to make a fast buck over the well-being of the people, then we expect that whatever agreements they go into will most certainly be against the masses of the African people. That is the major problem that I see in terms of our interaction with the world because i'm going to push for that to say that if any other country rises up to be a superpower the african bourgeoisie and the ruling class will go into dialogue with those countries against the, the will and against the well-being of the people the contradiction is the rulership or the leadership that has a a class antagonism you know with the people if you have antagonism with the people then whatever you get uh, whatever you get if you have a class antagonism with the people whatever you get will ultimately become a tool 
against the well-being and advancement of the people. So I feel to me on that issue, the major problem we have is the crop of the leadership or rulership that we have, you know, and uh, talking about Fanon, he makes a very, very good description of the character of these wolves and locust-like rulership that we have. That's one. And then the second part is that, again, we must also see, I'm going to pick from Cabral and Fanon too, that liberation or the act of liberation in itself is an act of culture because if you don't create the conditions for the social relation to change or the cultural relations to change then it's like pushing a rock uphill because once you have i'm, and I'm not saying that we shouldn't have you know a good approach would be the com communal strongholds and uh, interaction groups such that we can build a base to put into practice these new modes of thought and um, uh, carrying out our activities. But we must also look at the struggle, the liberal struggle as an act of culture itself. It is cultural because if you, if you look around where new relations have been made in terms of gender interaction, you see it is where just then it gives room for the survival of whatever new thing you want to implant in society. So this is very important. You see in um, Chiapas, Mexico, or for the brief period, Sankara was um, the president, the things that he started doing, or for countries whereby you have equity, justice, as well, essentially when a revolution has taken place. You start seeing positive moves towards liberation. You'll see in Cabral's movement where in liberated zones, the role of women started changing. In Samora Machel's country, um, Mozambique, I think they attempted that, but you know, he died. And all so we have to understand that this struggle for liberation in itself is culture. It is in itself a drive towards culture. So that's my own um, point, you know, on the issue. So we should also see it as something that will, it is the, is the fertile ground on which our progressive ideas can germinate. Thank you. All right, thank you for that, uh, Comrade Deji. Um, I think that is also important to note. Um, yeah, um, please permit me to quickly read um, Comrade uh, Makomba Kubeka comments i think i uh, made a very strong point here where he said um efforts for regional integration are done with very little enthusiasm the african union which was aimed at fostering development and continental unity is going at a snail's pace almost like in a disinterested manner okay um well i think uh, we can actually you know, take that point um, since we are discussing about uh, development uh, because, um, yeah, of course we are reading uh, Walter Rodney's, uh, but I believe he was speaking about the, um, you know, the African problem. I think that is one of the things that actually informed um, the writing of the book, you know, to you know, put in context uh, why Africa uh, is not developing or is or what development really is. So, um, yeah, here yeah, we're talking, I think the point Comrade Makomba is making is about uh, continental unity, you know, these are the dreams of Kwame Nkrumah and the founding fathers of uh, Pan-Africanism, you know. And I think that is also essential in, uh, uh, in developing Africa because there is no way we can talk of um, um, development without talking about continental unity. I think that's where Pan-Africanism comes in, socialist oriented Pan-Africanism, because <laughs> it's of course as they believe that we can actually advance um, uh, Pan-Africanism through uh, capitalism, which is actually false. So uh, I'll leave that open to the floor to, uh, you know, comment on uh, the, on the point of uh, continental unity. Uh, is that actually uh, something we should be looking at for you know uh, a question of uh, development in Africa? Because uh, you know, talking about 
imperialism and colonialism and also neocolonialism. I think um, uh, we should actually uh, you know, delve into that as well and see how that can actually help us in um, you know, uh, on the question of um, development in Africa. So um, I leave the, the floor open for contributions and comments on that. Well, I don't know if Commission Go wants to speak on that before we take uh, on the others. Well, if anybody has their hand up, uh, not yet, but uh, in the meantime, I mean, first of all, well, I think uh, in all this, again, you know, the aspect of uh, what what Rodney was was um, was talking about in the okay, somebody wants to speak. Nicholas, do you want to say something? Okay, and maybe that was a mistake. Um, uh, in the in the world we are in, you know, um, it's 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 a world that yeah, just to take the term the globalism or globalization, which was the natural consequence of the way capitalism developed. Now, you know, very interesting for me to find out, you know, <laughs> something I never knew, which was very irritating that the fascists who, you know, have been behaving, I wouldn't say misbehaving <laughs> in the United States in the last few, in the period, actually see their enemy as, as globalism. I think it's very telling. I, I actually really didn't know. And I, I was actually shocked that one of our members had bought into this ideology and things that they had written, which was basically targeted at China. And, you know, to find that Pan-Africanists were falling for the propaganda of fascists was very disconcerting for me. <laughs> really, I still laugh, but you know, it's the fact that, you know, it is a system of capitalism that created this, this kind of system of, you know, whatever they call it, globalization, which really is just a system of imperialism, of taking from another part of the world and having the free movement of labor, you know, free, take labor, take raw materials, take capital, but, you know, but do not allow but want to control that world and to maintain the benefits particularly for themselves well in that aspect of it now how do how does the rest of the world oppose that like i said earlier the fact that we had the soviet union isolated for so years so many years against this behemoth this monster it was never it was always going to end one way at the end of the day and we also have now, like I said earlier, that China at the pace, at, at the rate it's going, something will have to happen sooner or later. Um, but for Africa, and like I was also saying in terms of Africa's independence being crucial, we all know, and since Kwame Nkrumah, I don't think there's any, you know, it's not, the question has, you know, you know the answer. Nkrumah said it, it remains of utmost importance. But as the community has said here, African leaders are disinterested and the approach really has to be now for us, how do we get a movement from below that unites the Africans? That is what MAE believes. How do we get a movement from below that unites the, the progressive forces, the socialist forces in Africa, you know, so that we'll be in a position to take power and to have African unity, which will be the only solution. You know, no country in Africa can actually stand against the behemoth. No country can take power and survive. That's just the reality. So there's no way it's, it's, it's an oxymoron, it's a truism. You must have African unity. There is no, you know, um, I, I don't know. But I, I think what the comrade also said, because, you know, the comrade said some other things there, um, you know, about how we see China and, and such, you know. I think, I think that's, that's important. You know, um, you, you know this, this, this thing is crucial. Again, it is a question of independence. You know, and even in China's history, it was getting to a stage in which China understood the need to be independent in how it, it built itself. You know, that was the foundation for what, what brought it to where it is today. And how are we going to achieve that independence? You know, and then, then, then 
it is a cultural question, first of all, and it is a question of, of, of uniting the African peoples who, who are obviously united in terms of the, the history of exploitation. Uh, Bumi has a hand up, please. Uh, um, you can come in, please. Okay. I didn't like I didn't think I didn't want this to be going to a whole thing about the African bourgeoisie because I felt like that's not what we we're talking about today. But since we're already here, we might as well. And I just feel like the African bourgeoisie, the I mean Kwame Ture, he says that like they're the most corrupt, most most dangerous. They're just it because every if there's every time like even if like a socialist or like a left leaning politic is in the like cultural like atmosphere, there's still all this propaganda. And I'm not just saying propaganda in, in the terms of like state issue, like communiques and like things of that nature, but like there's still all this propaganda from Nollywood or from, you know, just casual advertising, marketing, like you're just this, all this <sighs> propaganda about, um, wealth accumulation and aspiring to wealth that the African bourgeoisie constantly reinforces through the church, through school, through, you know, minuscule like social relations, through marriage, through even the display of marriage, like, like all these, through like all these little, little things, they reinforce the, the idea that, you know, this is wealth accumulation, wealth building at the expense of other Africans. It's something that we should aspire to. And even when you bring into the, when you bring the realities of what capitalism is to the African context, when you try and like talk to people, the pushback, they usually would say, oh no, we can, we can do it without, no one wants to exploit people. Like we can do it without, you know, exploiting people. And like, I'm like, you cannot, you, you can't pay people their wages and be a billionaire at the same time. It doesn't make sense. That's not going to happen. Like that's not going to work. So like even when you try and talk to people, like to like everywhere around us, like reinforces the general idea and the principles of capitalism, of ind individualism, of everything that is the opposite of what we need as Africans. So honestly, I just feel like it's also about us like putting our own propaganda out there. I know propaganda has like a bad word but it's about us countering you know counter propaganda in addition to like political education and like you know struggling and things of that nature because it is the the church the church like alone it just one aspect of the church and the bible the way it like justifies the current state of like social relations like the rich the poor all these like you know, ridiculous things like that are like taken out of context. And like, I feel like the Bible is very reactionary, but that's like, that's not the point of the thing. But like, you know, things of that nature that reinforce the, you know, the, the capitalist, you know, way of thinking that don't serve to like help us. So honestly, I think that in, we should just start like making our propaganda and pulling up to these people's houses, all these neo-colonial stooges, wherever they are like people were doing during the NSARS movement start pulling up to them because they're not going to as Fernando says like there no one is going to I think Asada Shakur said this as well no one is going to give us anything like the only oh was well, CLR James who said the only time the rich give up anything is when they're running for their lives so like they literally have to be like they have to feel the threat of like violence and they're not going to feel that if most of our population still believes that you know we can all be like billionaires one day and in addition to that there's these you know there's the whole text who tell people you know we were kings and queens and the misinformation about pre-colonial africa and the romance the romanization of pre-colonial africa which i'm glad that rodney doesn't do in his book is like it's very dangerous you know it's very dangerous he sets this precedent that capitalism you know we were once the you know the kings and queens and we shall return back to that that state of overproduction of you know not meeting our people's needs or you know people don't have the full information of what was happening during that time so i just think that <laughs> countering propaganda with propaganda and like literally if if we have to like run up to and also like there's this man who was who was like going around british museums taking back they call it stealing like african art i think that 
taking away the legitimacy of these systems is a good way, would be a good way to break that psychological hole that these systems have on us. Like these systems are not, they're not legitimate. Like they have no like legitimate like standing except for the ones the Europeans say that they do. Like let's start tearing away at their so-called democracy. Let's start tearing away at all these, you know, the things that, the way they tore apart from us, the things that we hold near and dear. Let's start tearing away from the things they hold near and dear. All of this is nonsense. Your religion is garbage. All of this, your, you know, the way you organize your genders is garbage. All of this is nonsense. And we're rejecting it. And let's just start saying we're not going to do that anymore. We're not going to adhere to this ridiculous calendar. We're not going to treat our children like they're animals. You know, all these like nonsensical, like European ways of like social organization in, in addition to propaganda and stuff. So, anyway, that's just how I feel about it. Okay, thank you. Yeah, that was that was great, and uh, you know I think can't overemphasize that the the counter to the hegemony the hegemonic propaganda, you know, is, is this is really the battle. And we, to be honest, really, you, you know, you can't actually do anything without it. It is a process, the process of building a movement and a process of changing, you know, mindsets and the the cultural beliefs that in this case uh i just want to go back you know to the to the presentation or to the book you know because you know remember rodney said that the um superstructure in many respects can be inhibiting for development um and of course the superstructure we talk about the ideology and stuff and i i don't know what people Still about that my own opinion is the nature of the kind of religions that you know this the foreign uh religions and the way they are practiced right now as you were you know as Ruby was making reference to um to me it's 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 really inhibiting and it, it actually cause the frame of why people fall into a lot of this propaganda for example people falling into the fascist propaganda because they believe they are Christians and they also fall into the capitalist ideology on the basis of this. And, and it cannot be overstated for me, the influence that had, even in terms of building a movement, even in terms of overcoming the subjugation on we, under which people are under, that until we, we the religion in a sense can be turned into a, a tool for liberation in whichever way or you know that, that people get desensitized or de-propagandized, de uh, which can, I think, again, only happen in the context of a movement, of, of you know, movements from the grassroots, you know. But I, I just want to throw that open, you know, as we remember, you know, the question of uh, super superstructure and the question of religion, because this is the particular superstructure under which we operate right now. Um, there's this kind of belief that if you change the economic conditions, you will change the superstructure, you will change the ideology. But well, uh, in the sense in which Rodney explains it from a Marxian standpoint, this influences the superstructure. But the important point people forget is that the superstructure also has an import, impact on the base. And this is the stage in which we have, uh, we are right now. So I, I will throw that open anyway, if anybody wants to comment on that and the, you know, the other aspects of what we have been discussing. The question of religion in particular. Um, uh, well, I don't really have much to say on that. I just want to go back to what uh, Comrade OAG said earlier about um, colonialism freezing our uh, uh, our development at some at so, uh, at a point, and um, how we couldn't um, advance past that because um, uh, colonialism actually ended our growth uh, as a people and as a continent. So uh, that actually goes back to um, you know the question of um, you know <laughs> Bumi was saying uh, there are kings and queens in Africa. You know they just want to you know uh, you know. Um, you know, identify with the royal part of Africa, and they do not understand the history behind that because, um, you know, like Kwame Nkrumah said, um, 
uh, you know, there were there were also um, this. I'm just paraphrasing. There are also um, uh, feudal feudalist settings in Africa, uh, and um, col colonialism helps to expose that. You know, and uh, talking about kings and queens now. Um, um, you know, for 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 a kingdom like that to actually exist, it means that there were, you know, slaves who have to build the pyramids and all of that. You know, uh, you know as much as we want to, we don't have um, the accurate, uh, you know, historical, um, you know, understanding of how those things came into how those uh, they achieved those great technological advancement. Then um, we cannot excuse from the debates that we have um a master slave relationship as well then do not in the context of the europeans uh, so we have to be careful you know um you know aligning ourselves with cultures that actually didn't you know speak of africa uh, as it were because uh, you know everybody just wants to talk about egypt 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 and they didn't talk about the uh, other countries that predated Egypt, you know, that actually helps to, you know, that contributed to the uh, technology and the uh, political system that actually existed then. So, and um, and I believe that uh, through historical writings, we found out that uh, Africa was already living that stage. It was um, colonialism that actually helps to, um, you know, reawaken and restore those uh, institutions of oppression. Um, then, so um, I think we have to be careful, actually, and um, you know, um, you know, look at the communal part of Africa, which actually was our glory days, and you know, how it helps to you know eradicate uh, friction and you know accommodating of other tribes and uh, you know clans. So that is actually also important, you know, in development, you know. Like we have to actually teach what actually you know um, elevates our uh, status as a people. So uh, thank you. That's what I would say on that. So I have uh, Comrade OAG and Adibayo's hands. I think Comrade OAG hands was raised first, so I will take uh, Comrade OAG first. So Comrade OAG, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I want to give a quote by Michael Perenti. And he has uh, become my one of my favorite intellectuals. He says, "Capitalism is not just an economic order; it's a whole social order. That social order affects the superstructure. That whole um, umbrella which society is covered um, by, which is our religion, economic system, um, schools, finances, banks. Everything will now take." on the character of personal wealth accumulation, maintaining the order which the state um, does to uh, keep the ruling class, the capitalist ruling class. In place, okay. the media does the same thing to, to um, validate their wealth and all that religion does that i'm going to religion it takes that in places where liberation struggle has gotten to the, to the height not essentially that you now have you know, the liberation forces being the being the ruling class but their ideas have taken hold of society or maybe you're in the middle of a revolution then you start seeing that religion becomes a tool you know to mobilize the oppressed on the path of liberation once liberation is the base of what we're talking about you can go into those same texts to weed out all the nonsense that is reactionary if we still want to stay with religion or for people whoever wants to you know stay with their religion or whatever but it changes and when you have revolutionary societies the state changes to being the tool for the working class the media changes to being the tool for the working class. Education changes to be the tool for the working class and all that, you know. So we have to now look at at what point, at what point do we as struggling people, you know, do we come in on the terrain, you know, which is our best point? Is it the superstructure? Is it the base? You know, where is our stronghold? Is it um, media? You know, like 
these are things that we must kind of go back to the drawing board to know where the weakest point of these ruling class is and where their hold on society is the weakest. You know, and I think that can be found in the material conditions of the people, the worsening material conditions of the people. Once we have a movement that is expert at pointing these material conditions and linking it to the domination of this ruling class, then I think we'll have been able to make a significant dent in the cultural hegemony and even the uh, architectural framework that stabilizes and um, feeds the power of this ruling class. Thank you. Um, yeah, thank you, Comrade um, OEG, for that. Um, Comrade Aku, you have the floor. Um, Comrade OEG, I've already summed up the whole thing, but I just want to just chip in one or two things. And um, my, uh, what's it called? This position will come from this aspect whereby the so-called Pan-Africanists, let me, let me, let me quote, quote the culture of the Pan-Africanists, they try to assimilate history from the perception of what the Western press has been dishing out to us. If you check based on Western history, they, they try as much as possible to talk basically on, on kings and queens. They talk about um, what's it called? Um, King James and stuff like that. So actually, Africans who have been colonized usually try to decipher history through that um, um, concept of history. But we try much as possible not able to understand that if there is, if, if there is an empire or there is a civilization in Africa, possibly what drives civilizations are the, determines, um, determines the development of the people. So people are naturally keen on that, that it was the development, it was the social relation of that era that developed civilizations. So that's why I see all these people talking about kings, talks about the, what's it called, um, the so-called um, uh, chemist system and the whole things like that. Those things are not even improving us as a people because we, in some, ex, in some aspect of our history, we need to realize that there were, there were um, culture that are bad to our own development. So we still need to move away from that because like what I would just said, um, um, the base is what influences past structure. If we still hold into all this primitive base, how are we are going to develop ourselves to have a better superstructure that will even influence back to the people? So we need to be able to know how we are trying, what, what we are pushing out to the people should be reaching out to the people is is trying to identify um this um the liberation struggle in our history let's talk about the rebellion of different things that happened to africa there was checking by uh by uh what's it called uh a cultural way of life we try much as possible to resist all forms of oppression so those are the things we should be telling people people should be aware of you know history is that rejuvenates uh, what's it called? Um, the the liberation spirits in us. We usually just just try to just cling to the capitalist uh, um, history of what Africa was and what we were doing, and which only talks about the few class, you know, things like that. We should be able to liberate ourselves from that. So that's my own um, what's it called? Uh, submission for now. All right, um, Comrade Bumi, you can go ahead. Thank you, Comrade Aki, for that uh, intervention. Yeah, I just like to, I guess not push back, but just expand on the whole like base superstructure thing. I think that some aspects of um, some aspects of the superstructure are more impactful than others. That's what I'm looking for. Some aspects of the superstructure, especially in African societal organization in particular, and this is where sometimes I have a little bit. Um, oh, is that some is that um some aspects of the superstructure are um, more impactful than others? And if we're looking at currently our presently colonized society, 
like religion, like Christianity is inherently is, is inherently imperialist in nature. Like the whole, you know, go out and spread the gospel thing, and you investigate, you know, the 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 motivations of the the Catholic Church and the Anglican Church. You know, those are, you know, they're inherently imperialist and violent in nature. So I feel like taking this stand, or hmm, how do I say it's like like having to trying to use one thing like i don't see how how what how how what we're doing will be different from what they did like in the essence of trying to use the bible or trying to use christianity or trying to use one thing to get to you know to to to, to get to ends like use that as a means to get to whatever ends that we want like for me it's kind of like mm, like because religion plays a bigger role in our society than in western society or in you know any other like you know society similar to us even like before colonization we've always been highly spiritual people and that affected every like aspect of our lives so i guess my point is just that we should take greater effort and greater like um greater note of of the way our own dynamics work in our own like specific society in our own specific condition and and um playing i'm glad someone brought up the um, revolutions because for example even like the haitian revolution you know their own uh, indigenous you know spirituality was a major factor in them liberating themselves from that situation and so i don't think that i don't think that we should just leave Hmm. leave certain things to like natural evolution or to be like oh when this thing um when we get here then we can use that to do this like it's kind of like hmm, you know it, it it's kind of like wonky i don't know i know another word for it but i feel like because of the the stronghold and the ways in which religious colonialism is, is used to mis mystify a lot of stuff for us I feel like it's it plays too big a role for it not to be, you know, isolated and investigated um, as as a tool of um, in the ways in which it oppresses us and how to overcome that that um, oppression. I just wanted to point that out. All right. Um... Thank you. Uh, we have um, Mankuba um, with your hand up. Please go ahead, you have the floor. Mankuba, you have the floor. You can unmute yourself. Um, no, you can't. I'm only asking to unmute. Um, it's all right. Well, try and unmute yourself. You, you can't do it from here. So, um, in the meantime, I, I, I think I think the point the was making again. You know, that's quite hello. Good. Okay, yeah, hello. we're hearing you now. Go ahead. Oh yes, yeah. Uh, my name is Manoba. Time I'm with you here. Uh, yeah, I'm in South Africa and uh, I'm a former member of the Pan Africanist Congress. Yeah, I'm happy to be here. So, on the issue of religion, I think that. Okay, can you hear me? Yeah, 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 go ahead. Oh, yes, yeah, I'm saying on the, on the question of religion, I think it's. Uh, it's very much uh, 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 this thing uh, difficult that we can do anything about uh, religion except for maybe we need to change uh, 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 the base structure, meaning that uh, we, we need to create on the ground, you know, uh, communities, you know, which will be self-reliant, you know, and learn from their own work, you know, in order to, 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 to change, you know, to, to get what one could call social emancipation. Because uh, as uh, it once said uh, that uh, religion is a uh, spiritual opium and uh, once people are into that, it would be very much uh, uh, this thing difficult, you know, to change, uh, 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 to move them away from that uh, up, uh, before you are able to, 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 
to change their economic conditions. So, because uh, belief systems for our people, those, those systems are entrenched, uh, they are very strong. So, the, the, the most important thing, you know, is to see how you can come up with, you know, those uh, uh, social emancipation movements from the ground, you know, and uh, uh, on the basis of that, I think it's where that gradually uh, the culture will change, because this is a cultural problem, you know. Uh, that without economic emancipation, you know, there will never be a cultural emancipation. I think that's my just a, a little contribution. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, I think that's uh, an important point. But I want to say something on that. But I, I want to ask people, uh, especially people who came later, that um, please do drop your number to keep in touch. If you are okay with being added on WhatsApp, I want to also make comments about the use of WhatsApp. It's something we are considering within our group. We haven't decided to migrate out of WhatsApp as yet fully. You know, there are, there are levels at which WhatsApp is important, especially to join people who are, you know, more used to, to it. But there are also certain levels at which, for security reasons, you move to other platforms. And we are, we are still considering that matter. In that case, if you are you are not uncomfortable completely with joining WhatsApp, do leave your number or or just leave your number in any case and let us know how you feel. Um, we've got we've posted our social media pages on the chat. Please have a look um, and, and keep in touch because we will be you know con continuing to have a lot of these discussions. Um, uh, and it's very important to build links, you know, especially across the continent for how we can. Mm -hmm. You know to share ideas and and to build you know to build movements which is i think is the key thing that must always come out of this my own view about religion as i said earlier is it's it's not either or as such you know like i said the conundrum again is that yes you have to change the economic base to get a real fundamental change but there are certain really um regressive uh aspects of it that do limit and inhibit and the idea of, of, of people's consciousness rising, you know, I think particularly through struggle, you know, and as, as I think as you are pointing out, you know, building community um, structures, um, you know, the idea of community, which is uh, something, you know, I remember when we were discussing Fanon, you know, that's how that comes about through struggle. And when I say struggle, you know, you're not just, uh, you know, having protests or whatever, but building, um, grassroots activities you know mutual aid whatever it is that empower people in a communal setting in a way in which they share you know and then the, the that has an impact on the way they think if i don't talk about this individualist ideology that has penetrated you know through colonialism and that the, the antidote to it was through struggle uh, you know so because in the past it talks about it being an economic relation people see your friend has only been useful for their wallets you know and such and uh and through struggle now you know friend and family and all that start to have meaning and and again in our own context it's, it's important to see that now we we live in an extractive uh extractive economy in a sense a rentier economy not a fully developed capitalist economy but one in which either way in which you can you can make wealth fast for yourself <laughs> through any courts commissions corruption or whatever has become normalized and and it and you will see directly how the ideology follows that economic pattern it's an ideology that says you know i i, I see a lot of the religious beliefs as how do i win the lottery <laughs> at the expense of everybody else god help me and and uh, you know people just want to win the lottery that is for themselves um either way uh, you know I don't, I, I don't see you i accept the points you know two points here have been made that spirituality is not to be you know uh dismissed you know but but we are taking into account the kind of organized religion with the, the foreign influence that we have right now and that of course we cannot just get rid of that no matter how we wish it 
but the limit the way in which we can make it more liberating i think is necessary to be honest in my own opinion that i don't see a revolution unless there's a change in mindset to to a degree which again like i said is, is going to be achieved through struggle and through the structures we build um, um through struggle um we are rounding up but i, I would uh it's already five o'clock we've been here three hours uh but